Well, unless we give patient-specific treatment, we know that the cost will escalate. And I will not review this, but you guys are all in medical school and you do know all the issues with warfarin that is just uh, um, effective to a certain population and causes a lot of uh, economic waste uh, for the patients that are not uh, sensitive to it, right? So uh, you read the chapter and here's a great example. Um, I think that the time is really short, so I'm not sure if I really can ask uh, people to call to uh, answer. But when we look at this, um, we see an MRI with contrast and uh, we see a coronal image, we see a sagittal and we see an axial image. And at the bottom of this sulcus, and, and when I say this, this is the uh, temporal lobe, uh, we see a um, heterogeneously enhancing lesion, mostly um, with contrast. There is also a significant amount of edema. And here is a 3D reconstruction that points where the tumor is and then the tumor at depth. So because this is the brain tumor session, I'm sure that most of you would raise your hand and say, yes, this is a brain tumor. And yes, this is the differential diagnosis between metastatic disease and glioblastoma. And why do I say that? Because the examples that you had in your chapter look just like that, right? There is actually one little thing here that will point more toward one than the other. And that is the anatomical location. Brain metastasis do occur by and large at the gray white matter junction at the bottom of the salt site. And the reason for that is because of the uh, uh, vessels, the way in which the uh, uh, vessels are coming out of the sulcus. And we all know that the, the, the way in which metastatic disease reaches the brain is through the uh, vasculature. So what are we gonna do with this patient? Well, there are different possible options. This particular patient, we do not know whether or not the patient has cancer because his chest, abdomen, and pelvis are totally clear. So there is no evidence that this patient has cancer. We suspect that this could be metastatic disease, but could also be something else. I didn't tell you how old, how old the patient is. He's in his 60s. In any event, um, I think that everybody would concur that the next step is to obtain tissue diagnosis. And in the old days when I trained, they would say, why don't we do a biopsy, right? And so now we know that doing a biopsy is like, you know, the, the, step, uh, the, the step of the step. So you do a biopsy and then maybe it's diagnostic, maybe not. And ultimately you need to take out the lesion. So it is much easier and much safer to go ahead and um, remove this tumor. Now, one thing about brain tumors, by and large, is that, uh, and this is intrinsic um, primary brain tumor and or metastatic disease, is that when you look at the brain, the brain is normal. Is there anybody here that can tell me where the tumor is? No, right? Because that brain surface is absolutely perfect. And the reason why it's perfect is because the tumor, this is my pointer right here, the tumor is all the way at the depth. And uh, so just by looking at this with my eyes, I wouldn't really have any clue but all the way back um, when I um, started uh, fac being a faculty at Mount Sinai, we developed what is now widely used and it's called a um, image guided uh, technology that will allow us to see the instrument on the screen, to go at the bottom of that sulcus and to do what we call a metastatectomy. Basically, there was no invasion of the brain, it was just the splitting of the sulcus. The lesion came out in one piece um, and uh, we know that that decreases the length of stay, the neurological deficit, we another um, um, published on that, and also that decreases the incidence of metastatic disease. Now, we all use a GPS nowadays, right? So the, the idea to come up with a GPS of, the, GPS of the brain is like, duh, that's simple. But when we started looking into this, there were really no GPS. I know it sounds like it was a century ago, but it wasn't. And uh, and so what was really nice was to see that um, that uh, technology really resulted in a minimally invasive resection, in a very safe resection. And also what was nice to see was that when we started using it, we were the first one, and then in 93 there were three people, and then now in every single hospital there, is, there are more. I think at Sinai we have like three or four of these machines, different brands, but they do the same thing, right? Unfortunately, image-guided resection is not um, just in and by itself guaranteeing that you can perform that gross total resection. Uh, and we do know that there is brain shift that can happen. Uh, this was published by uh, one of our residents. And so we know that some of those images have to be updated and uh, upgraded. Uh, one possibility to do that for metastatic disease is to use an ultrasound, and uh, we developed this with uh, what is now uh, called Medtronic, um, 
uh, where we can use it. So any ultrasound interface it with the uh, preoperative and uh, preoperative images, and then intraoperative acquire images because all metastatic disease is um, echogenic, uh, echogenic, and therefore you can see it. And then at the end of the surgery, you quickly scan the brain and you can see lack of um, echogeneity that confirms a gross total resection. Now, the other way that we can uh, decrease um, the uh, death and the burden of disease is by um, addressing the metastatic disease uh, with stereotactic radiosurgery. What is stereotactic radiosurgery? It's the deliver of a very high dose uh, of radiation to a very well limited uh, volume. We use all sort of interesting um, technology and techniques. Um, a few years ago, the AANS asked me to write this book with multiple authors throughout the US comparing the um, linear accelerator with the gamma knife radiosurgery for uh, the brain applications. And basically at the end of the book, what we concluded is that it's really not the car that makes a difference. Is it a Lamborghini better than a Ferrari? The, the, what makes a difference is the team. So if you have a good team, you know, it's, it's a little bit of dealer's choice, which one you prefer. And here to the side, you see how a, gum, uh, how a uh, Linux accelerator works. Um, here is the multi-leaf um, uh, beam uh, that we use. And now, um, so at Sinai, we have, um, we have um, the uh, uh, Linux-based um, uh, machines. Uh, we have quite a few of those. We also have access to a gamma knife, and we also have uh, access to a proton beam um, uh, service now. And that is among uh, different institutions. And so what that does is that uh, those patients with brain metastasis that have uh, up to 10, 12 uh, lesions, we can treat all at the same time in um, a time lapse that is 20 minutes um, at the most. Uh, so as you can imagine, this really advanced the treatment and the quality of life of these uh, patients. So to sum it up, what can I say about brain metastasis? To me, in my career, um, Brain metastasis always meant that it is a team effort and it is incredibly important to have a multidisciplinary approach. I love soccer, I'm passionate about soccer. And I do know that if you just have one player, you're never gonna score that goal, right? You need the entire team to score the goal. Otherwise, that's it. The other thing that I learned is that we think um, that the brain is the most important organ, and in parentheses, I think it, I think we're right. But with <laughs> a big but, we have to remember that with for cancer patients, the brain is the tree, and the forest is as important as the tree. And so, if we think of the fact that our actions to try to help that patient have to be taken into the context of what else is going on. And now we have a lot of patient-specific medicine. This is a cartoon for immune therapy. And we know that for that patient is a very fine balance between not being able to be on steroids for some of the TKI, patient on TKI agents, they cannot have surgery for 30 days. So it's really important to weight all the pros and cons in a multidisciplinary forum, which we do at Sinai um, twice a week. We have brain tumors, um, brain tumor board twice a week. So um, very important. And you guys are all welcome to participate if you wish to do so. Going on to the uh, intrinsic primary brain tumors, right? So we said that some of the economic burden of the disease is the neurological deficit. And that neurological deficit can be caused by the tumor. The tumor is growing, and if you don't take it out, it will continue to um, um, alter, alter the patient function. But it could also be that if you're not a brain tumor surgeon and if you go in, you cause deficit. And if you do cause deficit, that patient's quality of life and ultimately uh, the patient's survival will be impaired. Why does that happen? It does happen because in the brain we have areas, and you guys know all this because you've done all the brain and behavior courses. In the brain, there are areas that are called eloquent. And what that means is that um, is a specific structure, part of the brain, for which no other structure can take up function in the event of an injury. Now, there is plasticity, and in children, um, there is more plasticity than in adults. But by and large, the patient population that I operate on doesn't have that much plasticity. So if there is even the, a tiny little error, that patient will have a permanent deficit. This concept of eloquent area is not just for tumors. It's also for epilepsy, for um, um, arteriovenous malformations, right? And so it is important to really understand what we're doing before we go in. So let's just look at this. This is a 55-year-old woman, right-handed. 
that presents with a um, left upper extremity weakness. And um, here, I'll let you watch this. Can you guys hear? No, so this is no. before, you cannot hear? No, no volume, just the work, just the video. Okay, so I will speak. <laughs> what I'm asking her is, can you, um, can you talk and you see that she has difficulty retrieving her words? Can you tap your fingers? And you saw that she had a weakness of the hand. And here she's trying to articulate why she's in the hospital. This is right before surgery. She has a bandage on because we put stickers on. So you see the difficulty in retrieving those words. So now if I ask you to um, take a look at this, right? And now I helped you a little bit by uh, putting the homunculus on the screen. On the sagittal image right here, can you see my arrow if I move it? Yes? Can you, can you see? Yes. Yeah? Okay, great. Awesome. Thank you. So when you see um, where this tumor is located, you see that this is the frontal operculum. And by the way, operculum means a lid. And so um, the word uh, really means it is a piece of brain, the frontal lobe that is like a little lid on the temporal um, bone. In any event, um, the uh, uh, frontal operculum, which is right here, is Broca's uh, area, most likely. And the motor area, you can barely make that the um, coronal suture is here, is gonna be right here. And here's the Penfield homunculus, and I facilitated this uh, in the interest of time. You can see that where the edema of this tumor is located is where the phonation muscles are. So why does she have difficulty talking? She has difficulty speaking because this tumor, most likely, it is stretching both the phonation muscle area, um, the tumor is right above, right? It's probably in the, uh, in the chin location, and it's also interfering with broca. And how do we know that this is not infiltrating? Because if it was infiltrating, if we went in with surgery, we wouldn't help her, right? She'll be the same. Well, the reason why we think that this is a reversible deficit is because most likely from the uh, radiographic diagnosis, as you saw in the chapter that you reviewed prior to this um, lesson, uh, that is either metastatic disease or GBM. Patient did not have any uh, uh, other cancer in their body, so most likely this is gonna be a GBM. And so GBM, by and large, um, the novel GBMs grow super fast, super fast, and they don't infiltrate, they don't destroy, but they deviate those white matter fibers. And or in her case, she is uh, producing uh, brain swelling edema that does um, produce the deficit. So this is a case where we know that if we go in, oh, I'm sorry, and this is just to show the white matter um, fibers that are distorted. This is, this is a very crude image. So here you could not really tell if this is infiltrating or not. It's just a nice picture, right? Um, but basically what we do know now is that if we go in with the navigator, if we don't injure any of our vessels, and if we go just for the tumor, here again, you see the tumor at the time of surgery. This time you say, wait, the, the cortex is a little bit abnormal. Sure it is. It's not on the surface, but there is so much swelling that this anatomy is destroyed. I always do a SSCP to locate the central sulcus. I also do some ECOG. In this particular case, you can see some uh, uh, epileptic discharges. And here is our post-operative MRI 24 hours after surgery showing that the tumor is gone. Now, how is she doing? Here she is. She's in the office seven days. I don't shave, so um, my patients don't, doesn't look like they're uh, brain tumor patients. And in the office, you see that she can squeeze my fingers. Um, the, the video I will not play, but um, you could still see that she's curling a little bit. So it's not as if the entire deficit is gone, but it's definitely improving, improved. And her speech is dramatically improved seven days after surgery. And now we go in the last uh, three or four minutes to the last uh, uh, burden that we uh, were uh, touching upon. And that is patient specific, right? So for brain tumors, it's tough. It's really tough. Because in essence, up to these days, we still do not know where they're coming from. There are three theories, and uh, one of our residents summarized this in a cartoon uh, with work that we did in the lab. Uh, and so we have a theory that was introduced many um, decades ago that brain tumors um, are originating from dedifferentiation of glia. This is big NAMI theory. When he described the glia, um, glia uh, sorry, the GFAP filament, he thought, uh, he saw that in glioblastoma multiforme, the G GFAP is missing. And therefore he said, wait a minute, these are glial tumors that are dedifferentiating and they become, uh, quote unquote, aggressive, histologically aggressive. 
great theory that has been standing and is still standing so many years later. And the other possibility from cancer, we took this, this is not our invention, is that instead there are um, stem cells, um, and now we know that there are stem cells in the brain as well, that undergo a mutation and then it is the glioma stem cell that give rise to um, the tumor. And finally, there is another theory that is the precursor cell theory that those cells are mutating and then um, they give rise to, to um, tumor. The bottom line is that all these three theories are coexisting. The uh, microenvironment, epigenetic, and metabolism play a tremendous role and it's kind of difficult to um, tell them apart. But as you can see from this cartoon, and, and tonight is not the night to elaborate on this, as you can see is that if you develop the, the best possible treatment for those quote unquote um, tumor cells, but you don't kill the stem cell, then the issue starts all over again. And again, this is not our, uh, meaning the neuro um, community that came up with that, but there, are, um, there is a lot of literature in the cancer uh, community as well. And so with that said, um, it is very important to understand the molecular signature of the, of the tumors. I hope you will have a chance to review what the new classification of tumor is. Uh, once upon a time, they were classified by appearance. So you guys probably have in your textbook, this one is, is called the fried egg appearance. And when we studied, when we took the boards, the, um, we saw one of these said, this is an oligodendroglioma, no more, no more. Even if it looks like a fried egg, it might or might not be an oligo because it all depends on the molecular signature of, of, the, of the tumor itself. This is incredibly important because the molecular signature is also what is allowing us then to, do, to um, implement those patient-specific uh, treatments. And so why am I passionate about brain tumors? Well, today I sat in a uh, NIH study session for 10 hours and tomorrow I'll do the same and then I'll continue to write. The reason why I'm so passionate is because there are tremendous challenges and tremendous opportunities opportunities. Um, the first one we already said is what you see, what you get. And Dr. Ajapanayas um, is, is a champion. He will show you everything that he has uh, implemented to really improve that quote-unquote vision to allow us to see those infiltrating tumors. Um, the other is, will today truth be tomorrow's truth? We have to keep an open mind because what we learn today might not be the same tomorrow. Good example, stem cells. We were thought that there are no stem cells in the brain and now we're going after chasing them, right? And then the, the last one is that we are neurosurgeons, we love to cut, we love to sew, but maybe there are also new scalpels for brain tumor surgery that um, are not necessarily what is depicted in the slide. And with that in mind, I hope that this will ignite some passion and that you all want to be a neurosurgeon. Thank you so much, Dr. Germano. That was great. Um, I think this is a good time to pause for a moment and answer a few questions. Um, there, let's see, most of these were actually about readings, so I will post those. Um, but it looks like somebody raised their hand. Um, Ahmad, would you like to ask a question? I'll allow you to speak. Yes, sir. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, Ahmad, we can. Oh, yes. Thank you so much for allowing me to ask a question. I actually have two part question. I'm, I'm sorry for being that guy. But uh, the first one is that regarding the meds, uh, is there like, um, I'm sure you guys face this um, problem that if there are you know, more than one met, how many do you have to go after them? And then this brings us to that another question, the second part of which is that, uh, what is the extent of eloquency? How far do you post that line? How do you know for sure that, you know, this much is eloquent and this much is not? Because I, if I'm remembering correctly, I recently read somewhere that, you know, not as much of the brain is uh, non-eloquent as we thought so. So if you could please... Um, sure, so the, the, there is evidence in the literature that um, for metastatic PCs, you have to address the, the entire tumor burden. As I showed, surgery is not the only option that we have. Um, there is also radiosurgery, and for very small METs now, some of the uh, TK inhibitors um, are very effective and efficacious. So the literature that show that um, you, if you do a metastatectomy of four or five lesions still stands, but the new way to look at that is that you don't necessarily have to go and cut all five of them uh, as long as then you address them right away with the radiosurgery. And if they're really small, it is important to address them with uh, the uh, systemic therapy. 
also we're shying away in um, cancer, we're shying away from number of lesions and we are more interested in tumor burden. And that is a novel, novel for us, for again, for the cancer people, it's not, it's not that novel, but it's very important to see how much uh, of the disease is in the brain and to remove the largest ones because we know that the small one we can address with the other thing. The um, question with eloquence, I think, is too long to, um, to go over. The most important concept is that if you go into the brain, that patient needs to be as good as it was before you do the surgery, sometimes perioperatively three or four days they have a little deficit but that should be a deficit that uh, results if you go in and you induce a new deficit the uh, um, survival the longevity and the quality of life is totally interrupted and disrupted so very important to uh, prevent that great and then uh, we have time for one more question before we go on to dr hajipanias um so ryan chu i'm gonna Go ahead and let you speak. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Hi, Ryan. Okay. Um, hi, Dr. Germano. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I actually have two questions. If I, if you don't mind, it's going to be really quick. Um, the first question deals with the WHO grading and the changes therein. Um, you know, we're all aware that the 2016 WHO grading changes um, added molecular genetics in addition to traditional mm -hmm. uh, histopathology. Um, although there are still areas such as uh, diffuse astrocytomas versus higher grade gliomas where you could have diffuse astrocytomas that are um, IDH uh, mutant, um, IDH wild type, I mean. Um, do you think we'll move point in the next WHO iteration where it'll be completely based on genetics rather than having some sort of histopathology? And then my second question deals with um, why lung cancers are the most common type of metastasis is this because we are not, um, we don't really have as good screening for lung cancers versus other, it oh, okay. because lung cancer specifically have Because the lung cancer, okay, the last, second question is very easy because lung cancer patients are, um, by number, there are just, uh, there are many more lung cancer patients than any other cancer, right? Because it does affect men and women. Uh, so if you look at uh, breast, um, there are also a lot of patients that have breast cancer, but it's 50% of the population. So that's just a mathematical um, calculation. The first question about the um, uh, histology, as opposed to just the molecular signature, I think the histology is still very important because the two go hand in hand, and I think it would be very difficult to depart from um, uh, looking at the cells and see what their appearance is. I am sure that um, the uh, genetics are going to be more and more uh, precise, but I would hate to just do a to make a diagnosis on on the um, uh, genetics by itself without also seeing the picture. Right? It's like right now I don't see you. I know that you're a medical student, and instead you can see me and you can see my voice. So I think it's always good to put the two together. With that said. Um, Maybe you're absolutely right. Maybe we will not need to see the picture anymore. So you will tell me in 10 years. Promise. Thank you so much. Great. So thank you, Dr. Germano. Let's move on to Dr. Hajipanias' presentation. So if you'd like to share your screen. Hey, everybody. Glad to see we have such a nice presence here. Thank you, Dr. Germano. That was really nice. I, I think that was a great way to start this off tonight. Um, are you guys seeing my screen yet? Or Let's we see. are. Okay. So uh, you know, I think I think you know at this point it's it's nice to kind of discuss some of the um, the technology that you know we're we're now using. Uh, Dr. Germano gave us a nice introduction of you know, neuronavigation, some of the tools that we use, but also the biology of the tumors, which are very important. And, you know, as we, we move along in neurosurgery, it's important to understand all components of brain tumors. These are my disclosures. And, you know, just briefly, I think it's, it's worth mentioning a little bit about this, that, you know, you can become a neurosurgeon scientist. So, you know, that's something that um, it, it's hard to say exactly what that means. Uh, I know what it means to myself. I, I have a busy practice. I have a, a laboratory that I oversee, and you know I, I'm involved with a lot of translational work that you know we're proud of, and we do do work as a team uh, together 
in the OR and, and also in the lab. So it, it's kind of a nice balance and, and you have to figure out what the right balance is for you as you move through your career, but it's definitely possible. And I think, uh, you know, I'd love to explore that with you more uh, if you have any questions. So we're gonna jump into kind of some uh, more, uh, you know, discussion about high grade gliomas because those are really the, the most common malignant cancers we deal with and, and probably the hardest ones to, to take care of. And while surgery as neurosurgeons we think is important, the other adjuvant therapies are quite important, and, and some would argue that they are even more important than surgery with uh, patient outcomes. But you can see here in this diagram, you know, surgery is one part of the equation, and we rely on our radiation oncology teams, our neuro-oncology teams to really help us with treating these tumors. Uh, I like putting this slide up because it, it really is a humbling slide. You know, when you look at uh, brain tumors and high-grade gliomas, there really hasn't been many drugs that have been approved by the FDA or devices. And, it, and it's, it just shows you how challenging these cancers are to really make an impact. And you can see here, you know, there's some classic chemotherapy agents on here and there's wafers that, you know, were approved and they're used not so much as commonly as they were. And then you have temozolomide, which is a chemotherapy agent we still commonly use. Navastin was a, a, approved for recurrent GBM. And then you have some other devices that have come out and newer technologies such as 5-ALA we'll talk about briefly that allows us to visualize the tumor during surgery. So this is really our current paradigm uh, in, in neurosurgery and surgical oncology for brain tumors. And you can see here we, we have a brain tumor that has contrast enhancement and the, the rim of it enhances. And, and that's what we see after we administer gadolinium on MRI scan. Um, the, the MRI scan uh, shows us a part of the tumor, and I'll discuss with you as we go along the presentation that really this is a, a, an ancient paradigm that we are slowly getting out of, but we're kind of stuck with for the time being because our technology has kept us here for decades. We know the tumor is not only that area, and the reason for that is because when we take out that area that enhances with contrast, patients you know, may do better, but you know, the, the tumors undoubtedly recur back in almost every patient. And the majority of recurrences are local in about 80% of patients, about 20% can have um, distal recurrences, but it, it, it tells us a little bit about the challenges we face with these tumors and the biology. And as you can see here, that same tumor I showed you before, look at all these little red squiggly lines present. Those cells are going all over the place. They're centimeters away from the, from the tumor. They're going to the corpus callosum and they're very infiltrative and that's our challenge right here. How do we see those types of cells away from that contrast enhancing border? So this is a, 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 an image of one of my patients years ago. We published this in neurosurgery in 2016 and you can see here, this is a case that I performed where you could look at the resection cavity afterwards and it has a white subcortical look to it. And you know, you thought, I thought to myself, I, I think it's a pretty good resection. I know there's still tumor there. And you know, the neuronavigation, which Dr. Dromano showed you, is, is unfortunately you know, a technology that we use. But again, it's a technology that's based on a preoperative MRI. So it's still not something that's exact. And brain shift always occurs as we take the tumor away. And we can use technology such as ultrasound or IMRI to help us with that. But even still, it's not a real time uh, solution to our challenges. And, and that's the kind of stuff that we as neurosurgeon and brain tumor surgeons encounter. So this is just a, a slide summarizing some of the technology that I routinely use in my practice. The lower left hand side is not one yet, but you can see here that you know, we're interested in seeing things. We're interested in understanding how to visualize the tumor better, but not only visualize the tumor, visualize the pathway surrounding the tumor, because that, as we heard earlier in the lecture, is very important. The last thing I want to do is take a patient to the OR and you know, beat my chest because I took out that contrast-enhancing tumor, and then the patient comes back and has paralysis of their arm or leg or both, that is a devastating outcome for me because I know that patient is gonna have a very difficult time getting through radiation and chemotherapy, and their quality of life, which is already limited, has now been really, really messed up. So we have to know the anatomy, we have to know where the tumor is, 
and we have to use technology in a way that'll help us. So this is an image of one of my cases I, probably about a year or two ago using an exascope. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the exascope. It's, a, it's a, a device that we use in the OR at Mount Sinai and I use this pretty much for all my tumor cases now. And it's a little bit different than the conventional microscope. So you can see how brilliant the view is. You can see the tumor is that brownish color tissue. And then where I place these asterisks, we know there's tumor cells there, even though you can't really see it there. And this is a pretty magnified view. The technologies that we also incorporate so that can we understand the pathways routinely in our brain tumor patients is called whole brain tractography. So we use nav navigation, whole brain tractography, and that really gives us an idea of where these blue pathways are that are critical for function. So when we're taking that tumor out, I'm looking for those blue pathways and I'm trying to avoid them at all costs. And sometimes that means leaving behind a little sliver of tumor. If that means I keep my patient intact, I'm gonna do that. I'm not gonna you know, resect the whole tumor and then, as I mentioned before, hurt my patient. The goal of brain tumor surgery is safe, maximal resection. That's our goal. So you know, this, I, this is a video I show of just in the OR, literally stimulating the brain and doing what we call subcortical mapping. And this, to me, is the gold standard. And this is something I learned from one of my mentors, Mitch Berger at UCSF, who is really the king of this, cortical and subcortical mapping. And it just really provides more information. And you know exactly where those fibers are based on the current that you apply either through a bipolar stimulating tip or a monopolar tip like this. And it, and it provides pretty sensitive uh, information that will tell you where those contralateral motor pathways are to the face, arm, and leg. So I do this routinely in my surgery, and it's just, it's just fun to do. You know, it, it gives you more information, and it gets our residents involved and really helps us uh, localize those important pathways so we stay out of them. So this is another thing that I love, too. Uh, we like using the exoscope, which you see here, which is attached to a robotic arm. So this is a, a case that I, I did with um, one of our ENT surgeons, uh, Dr. Juana. And, and it, as Dr. Dormano mentioned to you, Everything we do in neurosurgery is based on teams. Teams of surgeons, teams of nurses, teams of residents, teams of staff, everybody you work with, you rely them as part of your team. And when one of those team members uh, cannot be present or one that you rely on, then, then the system you know, doesn't work as well as it should. So you know, always take care of your team, in other words, and as you move into residency and medical school, very important concept. Take care of your team members so they can take care of you and treat everybody fairly and, and, and you'll go quite a long way. But anyway, so this is a, a robotic arm that you know, really shows how flexible it is and how much it extends out. And we can use that to guide our instruments and, and really help us with the surgery. And, and we'll show a little bit more as we move on. But you know, we've shifted away from the conventional binocular microscope to really this heads up display merge of technology. So one of the things at Mount Sinai and, and myself and Dr. Betterson, our system chair, we love having these technologies and visualizing them as we do our surgeries because you know, it, it provides us more information that we can then use to make decisions. And that's really what makes this fun is that I can have you know, tractography on one side, I can have my magnified view on the other and, and really kind of, you know, understand what I'm doing, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about fluorescence as well. So it's really kind of this amalgamation of, of technologies that makes us better surgeons and, and, and really make surgery safe for our patients. Well, this is another uh, you know, thing that we've really led the way here at Mount Sinai is adding a voice control feature. So let me see if I can turn this up for you. Okay, Dima. Light up to 30. Okay, Dima. Light up. So you can see here I can change the lighting, I can zoom in, I can focus with the voice control. I can even ask it to turn to a Pandora station. No, not quite yet, but we're working on that uh, feature with this. Um, and just, you know, this is a case that we presented at the CNS meeting last year in San Francisco. It was a live surgery, kind of highlighting this um, 
voice controlled robotic system. And again, we're using our technologies to help us understand location of the tumor, location of pathways to really prevent injury to our patient here. This is a recurrent GBM in our, our patient. This is an exascope view. I can't show you in 3D, which is what we showed. This was the first time uh, broadcasting a 3D view from the voice control uh, robotic uh, assisted digital surgical microscope. But this is the view you can see. It's just a beautiful view. We're trying to come around this recurrent glioblastoma. And, you know, just seeing things really just makes it so much better, right? If you, you know, when, when you're in the dark, you just, you don't have confidence in what you're doing. And when you light things up and you have the ability to differentiate what is present, delineation is, is so important. So this is just more images of that case. But, you know, I'm showing you, uh, I, I'm showing you, sorry, I think I have, this presentation's actually got a voice uh, over in it. So, you know, what I'm showing to you here is, you know, some of the, 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 the technology that we're using to address our visualization of tumors. But even with that, there is an unmet need uh, for patients to, um, you know, really see the tumor around the periphery. And, and that's where we kind of get lost a little bit. And I showed you that video before as I was coming around that tumor. But honestly, the, the margin you know, is kind of there, may not be there, and you can't really see it. So that's another area that, you know, I've focused on a large part of my career with fluorescence guided surgery. And this is something that I learned from our German colleagues, uh, you know, probably now uh, over 10, 11 years ago when I saw Walter Stumer present uh, at the NS meeting in Chicago. And a light bulb went off in my head and I said, man, this is perfect. This is something we need here in the U.S. I mean, why the heck do we not have this here to make surgery better and safer for our patients? It was a no-brainer. So that was my, my, my challenge for 10 years, uh, really kind of pushing this along. And, and, you know, we'll talk to you a little bit about it. But the concept is really a, a fluorophore prodrug that you use and you administer it to a patient. And then that becomes fluorescent and you, uh, you know, uh, highlight it with a microscope. And the reason why this is important is because it really provides real-time image guidance. So, you know, it, we don't worry about brain shift anymore because we can see the tumor directly. And that guides our surgery in real time. And if we combine that with other techniques that I showed you, DTI, mapping, cortical, subcortical, and motor mapping, then that becomes a very powerful tool to assist with our surgery to, again, perform safe maximal resection. So actually, this is one of uh, a slide I show here. One of our uh, star medical students at, at Mount Sinai, Remy Kessler, helped me with a book chapter um, a couple years ago. And what we did here is we wanted to kind of highlight the different fluorophores that are being used. So fluorescein is, is one that's been used for a number of years for ophthalmologic indications. And then ICG, which is on the right here, has been used for ophthalmologic indications. And you can see here, the uh, light spectrum of visible light, which is basically between 400 and, and, and uh, 650 uh, to 700 nanometers, which fluorescein and 5A layer are part of, and then ICG, which is part of the near infrared. But when you excite these fluorophores, they emit a light at a certain wavelength that's usually lighter than their excitation, uh, and that produces the color that we see. So Fluorescein sodium was actually the first fluorophore described in brain tumors in 1948 by G.E. Moore. And at that time, it was kind of a, 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 a coincidence where it was given to a patient with a brain tumor and then the fluorescein leaked into the tumor and the fluorescence was visible with, with uh, standard light because it's visible in, 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 the, uh, in the light range uh, of 500 nanometers, which is visible light. So that was something that heralded, you know, fluorescence guided surgery, but it wasn't really pushed on after that point until uh, things kind of heated up much more recently with fluorescein uh, for brain tumors. But it's an extracellular agent and it's time specific. So you administer it systemically at the time of anesthesia. And what happens is, um, you know, it leaks out into the tumor, but it also leaks out into the dura and then surrounding brain tissue. If, if, you, if you perturb that tissue with uh, surgery, it can cause it to light up. So ICG is another nonspecific fluorophore, been around for a number of years. We use it in, in intraoperative angiography all the time for, for aneurysms to make sure that we've properly uh, embolized them uh, with, with uh, properly uh, secured them with clipping. 
and then AVM resections, also ECIC bypasses, but it's also being used for brain tumors as well. The strength of ICG is that it's a near infrared floor pore, so it penetrates tissue much better, and the, the, the signal to background ratio is much higher. However, it still is extracellular. It's not binding to anything specific. And actually, one of my colleagues that I went to residency with, uh, John Lee at Penn, you know, has done a lot of this work, and, and you know, he's really done a nice job you know, telling the ICG story in brain tumors. So let's switch gears a little bit to 5A lay fluorescence guided surgery. And again, I'm showing you that same resection cavity we saw before, and then now uh, using the blue light and exciting the protopore for nine, you can see that violet red fluorescence that's pretty, pretty uh, robust. And that tells us that there is a fair amount of tumor left behind there. Now, 5-LA is an interesting drug because it's actually a prodrug. It does not fluoresce on its own. It has to be taken up by glioma cells and it's metabolized to protopore for nine. So the beauty of 5-LA though is that it gets into brain tumors really nicely. Uh, it crosses the blood-brain barrier. It's less than 200 kilodaltons. It's hydrophilic and, and it really gets in there and it's metabolized. And the other thing that's kind of neat is that each compartment of the tumor that you're in fluoresces differently. So the main solid portion of the tumor will light up red fluorescent, whereas as you get to the margin, it becomes pink. And that's because the cancer cells are more interspersed between surrounding brain cells, so the fluorescent signal comes down. And then at some point, you'll see no fluorescence as you move past this area, uh, you know, past the contrast enhancing border. So I'm just showing you a quick case here. This is a, another case of mine. Uh, again, showing you that the classic paradigm where there's that contrast enhancing mass, but we know the tumor is outside that contrast enhancing mass. Um, patient got 5-LA four to five hours prior. Um, we went and, and took the patient to the OR for a craniotomy. We did mapping and we did the 5-LA fluorescence guided surgery. So this is the tumor. And you can see here, this is a white light view of the tumor. And then I switch to the blue light to excite the protopore for nine. And then you can see this brilliant, uh, robust view of the tumor underlying the peel surface. That's how robust that fluorescence is if it's close to the peel surface. It's pretty obvious. And it's just, it's just beautiful. You know, it's a beautiful view. And then as we get out to the tumor margin, you can see here that, you know, we have uh, the tumor becomes less violet red and becomes more pink. And as I'm resecting that pink, all of a sudden I get past the pink and then you don't really see uh, much of the fluorescence anymore. Even though there is fluorescence present, we just can't detect it with the microscope. But if we get to this point, we're pretty confident that we've done a decent job with the resection because we know that goes past the contrast enhancing border because of some seminal work that Dave Roberts and the team at Dartmouth, Dartmouth have shown us through the years. And this is that post-operative MRI scan. While I took out the contrast enhancement, once again, there's always tumor left behind. So if someone tells you that they took out a high-grade glioma completely, just keep looking at them because you know they can never take it out completely ever. Anyways, this patient had a recurrent GBM. He went on and had some chemotherapy and he's still just hanging in there, but you know, it is a recurrent GBM and he's approaching his, uh, uh, let's see, I guess it's 10 months since we did the resection with a recurrence. So it's been two years since his initial surgery. And I did perform his initial surgery. One of the things I do want to highlight to you is that, you know, this work was really heralded by Walter Stumer, who's one of my close colleagues in Germany. And this randomized control trial really nailed it out of the park for us. And, you know, it was a phase three study where patients did or did not go through 5-LA fluorescence guided surgery. And you could see here on the left how much greater those resections were with 5-LA in red, almost double what they were without. And in a randomized study, that just was it, right? And that was something that really led to the European approval. And in addition, progression-free survival was significantly benefited as well. So, you know, there was some critiques of the study. It wasn't powered for overall survival, and not everyone had temozolovide, not everyone had neuronavigation. But think about this. Not everyone had neuronavigation, and then they still got 60, almost 64% resection of that contrast enhancing uh, portion. This is the 5-ALA approval timeline. I just wanna show you how long these things take. And when someone tells you 20 years, that's how long these things take, 20 years. 1998 was the first clinical trial that Walter Stumer performed in, uh, with 5-ALA. 2006, he published the randomized phase three study. 
EMA, which is the European version of FDA, approved it in 2007. Then we did the first FDA meeting in 2011. I started this whole process in 2009, 2010. And then we started the first uh, IND in the US in 2011 with the agent called Gliolan. And then we just went back and forth with the FDA. And we finally got them to convince that we had a way forward for FDA approval. And it got approved in 2017. But even after that, it took a year for it to get distributed to reach hospitals because of marketing. And here's a you know, picture of the entire village it took uh, to really take this to approval at the FDA. Industry was crucial. Neurosurgeons from Europe, neurosurgeons from the US. We had patient families there. I mean, we had everybody there to make this thing work because this is our one shot to get this through. So it's FDA approved for newer recurrent high-grade gliomas. And you can see here, this is a publication we had last year in a special edition. And you know we have it approved for um, other types of uh, tumors as well. Um, you know it's being investigated right now for meningioma, so that's a, uh, something that probably will be approved in the short term. But you can use it in ependymomas, hemangioblastomas, low-grade gliomas are also something that we're investigating. You can use it for biopsies for high-grade gliomas, CNS lymphoma, and then I'm not going to talk to you about photodynamic therapy, but that's another area that we're we're jumping into. But there are newer generation floor pores coming out. These are targeted, and these are an exciting uh, floor pores that we're learning about how we can target the specific cancer cell receptors, EGFR, uh, a scorpion toxin, which, which blinds to a chloride uh, receptor uh, channel. And you can see here the, the rapid growth of FGA, FGS has just been phenomenal. I mean, 2008-19, uh, 340 publications, and, and really one in 1998. So that's been cool to see. Some other areas that are, are rapidly gaining steam are not only the floor pores, but devising technologies that can allow us to really visualize the fluorescence better. And this is another article that we have published, you know, kind of using handheld devices to visualize that fluorescence. So stay tuned for that. That's another area that really needs to be studied better. And there's other technologies too that don't rely on fluorescence, like Raman spectroscopy, that's, that's really exciting as well. This is just a, you know, a paper that we did, I guess it's been five years now, with a handheld device comparing it to the microscope, and it's just orders of magnitude better. Uh, and this thing was a great device, and then the company went belly up, and we're trying to revive it, um, and we'll see what happens. Um, you know, other, other groups are working on this too, for low-grade gliomas, use, using a handheld device to really detect protoporphyrin 9 in low-grade gliomas. So it, it, it's just exciting, and, and Peter knows this, you know, we're passionate about getting this to the children with brain tumors because we know that children, you know, who have more extensive resections can actually live longer and better. Um, imaging modalities, we're combining it with, I mean, it's just, you know, it, it's kind of opened the, the door for a number of things. Using it with intraoperative MRI is another area, and then actually combining floor pores is a neat area too, where you can use 5 ALA with fluorescein in this example. So we're almost done. Now, there, here's my last slide. So I want to leave it open because I do want to have you guys uh, ask questions. That's really important. You know, we want to have fun tonight and, and really generate some interest in neurosurgery and some buzz about our program at Mount Sinai because we're pr proud of it and we have a great group of people we work with. Uh, and I think there's a lot we can offer you guys here. So I'll open it up now for questions. Uh, and please ask any type of question. Peter, do you want to kind of guide it? Yeah, well, there, there are a couple in the QA box. That you're on, you're on uh, mute. Unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, can we can. Me? Yes, okay, we can. Good. Yeah, so, uh, you want to take my screen? No, I, I, so I, there are a couple of questions um, in the QA box that I want to pose to you. So one was... Um, We're still not well hearing you, I guess. Uh, um, I, I can hear him. I think his audio is okay. Do you want to call me on the cell phone? I could, I could just put it on can, speaker. Can you hear me, Chris? Yeah, I can hear you. Yep. Yeah. So, oh, so they can hear you? He muted his computer okay. earlier. Um, oh, Chris, Chris you, muted, you muted your computer for the... Uh, yeah, I just did that, didn't I? Yep, yep. You know what I did is I muted it because I had the voiceover on. <laughs> can, you, can you hear me now, Costas? Yeah, my bad. Okay. So Take ownership for that one. Here, here's one. How, how well does the robotic exascope do for depth perception compared to a conventional microscope? So, you know, we had the opportunity of um, using the 2D version first. 
for a couple of years before the 3D version came out. And at first, you know, your brain, it, it's, it's a challenge because your brain's trying to grasp onto a three-dimensional view. But because the optics and the clarity of the tissue is so great, it's better than the microscope. Your brain starts differentiating tissue uh, colors and textures very well. And at the end, you know, I was really operating quite well in a 2D mode. Uh, and then, you know, a lot of us, as you'll know, as you go through residency, we spend a fair amount of time doing endoscopy. And endoscopy is all 2D high def view. And, and that's something that we really get comfortable with in our training. So I think, you know, those things are helpful. But at the end, there's the 3D version now. So, you know, you have the 3D view uh, available to you. You can switch back and forth. Okay. Um, and then another question is, um, why does 5-ALA not get metabolized or get metabolized by non, sorry, why doesn't 5-ALA get metabolized by non-tumor cells? Yes, yeah, so the the made it related to the mass of tumor tissue? So the reason for that is if you look at the heme biosynthesis pathway, I should have shown you guys this because you, you're probably more versed at this with your biochemistry, but if you look at the heme biosynthesis pathway, uh, 5-ALA is in our body already. So when you look at its metabolism, it gets broken down to protopore for nine. And then there's an enzyme that adds iron to protopore for nine to form heme. And that enzyme is called furochelatase. So gliomas have less furochelatase present. So protopore for nine backs up in those tumor cells. And that's why you could uh, visualize the fluorescence. It's really be beautiful in the brain because there's minimal to no um, metabolism in surrounding cells. The only time we can see that happen is in recurrent uh, glio gliomas, where you know, there can be some reactive astrocytes that have been treated with radiation and chemotherapy. And again, that's still in the resection cavity. It's not outside of the cavity. Uh, so you know, we haven't found that to be uh, uh, difficult. That's a great, that's a, I think a great, Great question and good answers there. I think we have one, we have time for one more. Um, this is another one about 5-ALA. Can you comment on the negative predictive value of 5-ALA? Yeah, that's a great question. So when we went to the FDA, you know, we hit it out of the park with positive predictive value and sensitivity. The one thing that we struggled with was negative predictive value. And, and if you look at the studies that were done, the negative predictive values weren't in the high 90s like they were for sensitivity and, and positive predictive value. And the reason for that was because of the biology of the tumor. So remember that slide I showed you with the cells kind of going all over the place? So when you biopsy those areas, while they weren't fluorescent, right, they still had cancer cells present. So that's why the negative predictive value became a, a challenging point. And we had to teach the FDA that the NPV was due to that. It was the biology of the disease. The further we went out from the resection cavity, we knew there were cancer cells present, but the fluorescence was minimal to none with our current technology. That's great. Um, there are more questions, but it looks like we're out of time. Thank you, everyone. This is obviously a popular session and, and a, a great discussion from Dr. Germano and Dr. Hadjipanias um, and a great turnout as with